Greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to AMC Mailbag. This is the mailbag spin-off show, if you will, of our daily AMC movie talk show, where, of course, uh, every day we discuss the movie news Monday through Friday. And in AMC Movie Talk, we always take questions from you guys. At the end, we take it from the mailbag, which you can send us questions anytime at amcmovietalk at gmail.com, which you can see down here. And... Every day, though, Monday to Friday, we only have time to take, like, two questions. So we thought we'd start a new show on the weekend, Saturdays and Sundays, doing nothing but taking your mailbag questions. And hence, we have AMC Mailbag. My name is John Campy. I'm the editor-in-chief of uh, AMC Movie News. And joining me today to help me with the live stream, because we are doing this show live, for those of you who don't know. And uh, joining me to help keep an eye on the chat board and to get your questions is my wife, Ann Campia. Hey, hey Ann. everybody. Thanks for having me again. So thank you for being had and for being here. People, uh, for whatever reason, people seem to like having you on the show. Because I am the better campia. You are the better campia. I have no doubt. And <laughs> my mother agrees with you that you are the better campia. So, um, yeah, we got a bunch of uh, uh, questions to get to here today. We've uh, we've got uh, our house back to ourselves. But as you know, this, this is Studio B. Uh, of, of AMC Movie Talk, you recognize we sometimes have shot AMC Movie Talk here. We do mailbag here. This is actually my home office. <laughs> <laughs> AMC yeah. Movie Studio B is actually my home office. So this is being done from my home. Uh, and uh, we've had friends staying with us from Canada. Yes. And now we have our home back. Not that I didn't like having them here, but it's nice to have our home back. Very polite people. Very polite people, yes. Had a good time. <laughs> had a good time. All right. Well, anyway, guys, listen. We are going to take the uh, first number of uh, minutes here to talk about uh, email questions that came into the mailbag, but then we're going to set aside some time to just take your questions from the chat board. So Anne over here is keeping her eye on the chat board. I wouldn't bother putting your questions in yet. Wait until after we get done like the fifth mailbag question and then start putting your questions in because we, we've got about 20 minutes before we get to those. So talk amongst yourselves, leave your thoughts on anything we discuss here, including the, the questions we're about to address, and uh, then we'll get to your questions in, in the chat board. So. Let's get started with mailbag question number one. And the first mailbag question today comes to us from David Jackson, who writes, Hey, John and gang, great show. I like how you don't let people's negativity affect you and what you do and say. But anyway, enough with the niceties. I've got a question. Of the big blockbuster movies coming out in 2014 and 2015, which one would you like to produce slash direct so that you could cast it in your way and have it shot and made your way? Thanks again for doing what you do. Bring on the stinking, filthy, nasty, uh, or nasty, filthy. Uh, and, of course, that comes from uh, David Jackson. Well, thank you so much for the uh, question, David. Now, I think a lot of you are going to assume that I would say Star Wars. Because Star Wars is my number one all-time, hands-down favorite film. It is the most influential film in my life. My earliest childhood memory is my mom taking me to see Star Wars when I was a little kid. And um, as a result, it really molded and shaped my love for movies and my imagination and all that kind of stuff. But I don't want to ruin Star Wars, so I'm not going to – I wouldn't pick Star Wars. I, I'll let J.J. and Kathleen Kennedy and, and that whole group of people, I'll let them deal with Star Wars. I think the one that I would choose to do would probably be Warcraft. Um, because I think there is so much potential for Warcraft. The world is so imaginative. It is so vast. It's so beautiful. It's so gorgeous. There's, there's, there's some pre-existing mythology there, but a huge wide open door to, to create your own mythology at the same time. Um, and so as far as casting, now the rumors have it that Colin Farrell... Uh, is going to be the main uh, dude, lead, uh, lead guy character in Warcraft. I think that's, I personally think that's a great choice. Um, but I think, yeah, Warcraft. Warcraft is the one I would do. And I'm going to ask you if you could produce and be in charge of any movie coming up in 2014, 2015, so you could do it your way, which one would it be? Is uh, Dumb and Dumber 2 coming out in 2015? I believe it is. It might, oh, actually, no, it might even be 2014. Yes. That's I would, the one. I have seen Dumb and Dumber 2. Yes. Uh, I don't know how many times. Hundreds of times. Dumb and Dumber 1, you've seen hundreds of times. I mean, yes. Yes. And I would love to hand, have a hand in that making that movie. Just because there's so much you can do in terms of referencing back to the first one, which I love so much. Right. So that would be mine. All right. Well, guys, uh, leave your thoughts in the chat board. Which one would you do? Okay, let's move on to question number two. 
Question number two today comes to us from Will Bernard, who writes, or Barnard, who writes, Hey, MC Movie Talk, I'm a huge fan of yours. Thank you so much, Will. Uh, my question is this. Uh, through the, the past four years, the highest movie grosses over the year have all been part of a franchise. The last, uh, the last original one being Avatar in 2009. Do you think any movies with original plots have a chance of being the year's top grosser in future years? And if so, which one? Well, well, I, I think it all depends on how you approach your question. Let, let me talk a little bit about the semantics of your question first, and then let me answer it. Um, when you say original films, what do you mean by original? All movies come from somewhere, whether it's a comic book, a screenplay, a novel, a, a myth, a, you know, local folklore, whatever. All movies come from something. Something is the source before it becomes a movie. Um, and I would argue that while the first Thor movie is based on a character, a pre-existing character, it was far more of an original film than Avatar was. Now, I, I love me some Avatar, but Avatar was a plot point by plot point complete narrative ripoff of Point Break. Um, of, you know, some people say of Pocahontas or Fern Gully. I mean, I, I would argue with you that Thor or even Iron Man 1 was a more original movie than Avatar was. Uh, just because Avatar has put a name on it that has never been used doesn't make it more original than another movie that just happens to have the name of a franchise with it. I mean, a lot of people, it, it, this is an issue that actually drives me nuts, honey. Drives me nuts. Because you get a, a lot of people who um, will often have this debate about, oh, this something that's original, something's not original. Just because a, a movie, like the amount of originality that goes into films, regardless of where it came from, I mean, is, it seems to be completely tossed aside by people. When, yeah. they're, when they're talking, I was like, oh, wait a minute. This one has the title Avatar, which that title hasn't been used before. This one has the title Iron Man. Therefore, mm -hmm. this one's original and this one's not. Do, do you like? Do people think that's where originality is in movies? In the title, is that what your interpretation of originality is? Not the narrative and how it's put together and the way that story is told and the way the characters are used and blah blah. blah. There is more originality that goes into, like for example, Empire Strikes Back. Yep. There is more originality in that film than almost any film in history. But it's a sequel, so therefore it's not original. That's a ridiculous argument. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, yeah, I, I, my argument would be like Thor, Iron Man 1, um, The Dark Knight. These are all more original films than Avatar. Oh, yeah. Even though Avatar has the, the big title. Now, to, to your question, though, and it's a really good question about could what what movie could come out and be the biggest blockbuster hit of the year box office wise that is not a part of a franchise honestly in the foreseeable future i don't see it happening and the reason i don't see it happening is is, is simple association look we know james bond we're familiar with James Bond. We all liked the last James Bond, and therefore, when a new James Bond is coming out, that James Bond film has a leg up on a lot of other films that are part one or original franchises or whatever, because we as movie-going audience members already know this franchise. We know that we like it. We like the characters already. I mean, half of the marketing battle is already done. It already has us. And therefore, it is more likely to get people to go out to the theater to see it than, say, a film that no one's ever heard of, of a story that they haven't heard of yet, and blah, 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 blah. Now, those films can obviously still be huge successes, and, you know, all franchises got to start somewhere. But the reason I think you've seen that these franchise films and sequels and things like that have been the number one box office uh, movies and will continue probably for the next little while is because the marketing battle is already 50% done. We know these characters. We know this film. We know we like the last one, and therefore we're more likely to go out and see another one of it. It's, and you know, there's nothing wrong with that. There is nothing wrong with that. Uh, uh, so um, I think that's why you see it happening. And for the foreseeable future, I don't see that changing. When you've got Star Wars Episode Seven, and you got Batman versus Superman, and you've got Avengers Two, and you've got Jurassic World, and you've got the James Bond franchise, and you've and you got on and on and on and on and on and on and on. 
it's going to be tough for a film that's not part of a franchise to beat that at the box office. So, you know, come out with a new original film and be great and awesome so people love it. So when you do the sequel, then it stands a chance of being like number one film at the box office for the year. But uh, until then, I, I don't see it happening. Good question. All right. Third mailbag question today comes to us from John Kresko. Hope you're pronouncing your name right, John. Uh, and he writes, hey, everyone, it's me, John. <laughs> Hey, John. Anyways, my question is uh, for you today is about people complaining that their person that they wanted to win didn't win at an award show. Do you think that some of these people are biased since they only since they only like this person or haven't seen any of the other nominees work? Also, do you think people who get nominated for awards and don't win should be grateful that they got recognized for their work at least? Have a great day. Thank you so much for the question, John. Um, first of all, let's ad address this term. This is a, another big uh, issue for me, is this term bias. I think people misuse the word biased quite a bit because um, they use it too loosely and in a way that isn't actually fitting in with the definition of the word. Okay, look, sometimes I'll be talking about um, uh, you know, uh, Man of Steel. I call Man of Steel the number one, I think the best comic book movie of the year, better than Thor 2 as much as I loved it, better than Iron Man 3, which I liked very much, uh, better than Wolverine, which I liked very much, Man of Steel. And inevitably what I have, um, uh, what's the technical term? Uh, brain dead idiots. I get brain dead idiots who will then jump on and, and try to argue with me by saying, and, and by the way, there's nothing wrong with disagreeing with me, that, that's fine, but the brain dead idiots, and that's the technical medical term, I will get on and say, well, John, um, you're, uh, you're biased. I, bi biased? Biased? First of all, that's an idiotic thing to say because I, if you ask me, everybody knows what I call the greatest comic book movie of all time is Avengers. So I say, you're, oh, you're biased for, uh, for DC, you're biased. Then I want to sit down with them very softly and gently and say, okay, why did your parents not ever send you to school? Honey. <laughs> <laughs> she gets uncomfortable when I get everything. Why did your parents never send you to school? Do you understand what bias means? You're suggesting that I actually have some kind of personal stake. Now, you could say I'm biased if I was a shareholder in DC Comics. Yeah. If I was a shareholder in Warner Brothers and I stand to personally gain from DC being better and Warner Brothers being better than Marvel films, then yes, I am biased. If my if uh, uh, Christopher Nolan was my brother-in-law or my best friend growing up, then you could say clearly there's there's a pre-existing prejudice towards it because of this relationship you have monetarily, business-wise, friendship-wise, whatever, you stand to gain from it, blah, blah, blah. Then you can say I am biased because that does create a bias in me. And you know, a lot of times um, I'll, I'll talk about um, Crank 1, Crank 2, things mm -hmm. like that because Mark Neville Dean, Brian Taylor wrote and directed them. But I'll often say take my opinion of a Neville Dean Taylor movie yep. with a grain of salt because I am biased because they're the guys responsible for me meeting Anne. They're, they're basically the guys who introduced me to Anne. <laughs> so I am biased when it comes to Crank 1, Crank 2, um, any future films that Neville Dean or Taylor are going to do. I tell people straight up, I'm biased because I have a connection there. Uh, and th therefore, with those films, I'm biased. So I'm still going to give you my honest opinion, but you got to take it with a grain of salt because I'm biased. And i got to admit that up front. But we throw that term around biased way too easily when it doesn't fit the actual definition of the word. These people, oh, you're biased in this and biased in that. It's like, really show me my stock. Show me the shares that I own in that other company that makes me biased. I'm not biased, I'm just giving you my opinion. What I thought was best this year, what isn't. So it has nothing to do with bias. That being said, I think you raise a really, really good point. And this is something that I, I come across a lot all the time, uh, especially in award season. Um, I remember when Christopher Nolan didn't get nominated for uh, Best Director for Inception. And uh, I, I mean, I, gotta, I thought he should have been nominated for Best Director. He should have been nominated. I don't think he should have won, but I, I think he absolutely should have been nominated. And he wasn't. Okay, whatever. And I remember I getting these discussions with people and they'd say, you know, it's a joke that he didn't win. He should have won, blah, blah, blah. And I'll be like, well, didn't you think... 
this movie was any good and the directing job that, that this guy did, you didn't think any of them were any good? Well, and this is what happens quite often. Well, I, I mean, I didn't see those movies, but Nolan did a great job with Inception, therefore he should have won. Eh, do you see the problem? <laughs> like, it's, yeah, you're right in your question. It does drive me a little bit nuts when I get in these arguments with very passionate people making an argument that so-and-so should have won. And then when you press the issue a little bit, you realize they didn't even see four out of the five people who got nominated for it. It's like, well, wait a minute. How can you say definitively this guy should have won when you didn't even see the other ones to know if they did a better job or not? Uh, and you're right. That happens. Uh, it's unfortunate. Uh, I think we need to, think, need to think a little bit more clear-headed about that. Uh, I did see all the films that got nominated that year and all the directing jobs, and I still think Christopher Nolan should have been nominated for an Academy Award for uh, for his work in that film, but that's just me. Uh, and as far as should nominees just feel really good and grateful that they got nominated? Absolutely. An Academy Award nomination is a very, very difficult thing to come by. You know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of films get released every single year. And when it comes down to the Best Actor category, five out of all the hundreds of films that came out that year and the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of actors who had leading roles that year, five get nominated. Never take that for granted. That if a dude gets an, a nomination for an Academy Award, that means something. Even if they don't win, uh, I think that's really, really something. Uh, it's very difficult and uh, I, I think they should be, should be appreciated more. And I hear you giggling over there <laughs> once in a while. Are, is, is, is anything interesting being said in the chat board? Uh, well, our buddy Edward Douglas is in the chat. Oh, no. <laughs> Edward, who's the weekend warrior from coming soon? Taking some bets on whether you were actually going to answer that last question. I answered not. it, Edward. <laughs> I answered it. I sometimes take a very long about way to get to my answer. <laughs> Long-winded as I am, but eventually I get to the point. All right, let's get to the next question. Question number four is, and by the way, guys, you can start getting your questions ready for the chat board if you're watching live. Uh, Tandi Uma writes, I'm an AMC addict. Hashtag love AMC movie talk. Thank you so much, Tandy. Um, I'm going to have to go to a conference to get unhooked. Anyway, my question. Pixar's greatest flop is obviously Cars 2. But before that, Cars was their weakest link. It was received well, but not on a level. Do you think Pixar tried to redeem Cars with C2, or was it just a money sequel? Live long and prosper. Thank you so much for the question, Tandy. Um, and once again, I am going to uh, buckle in. I'm going to take a long-winded way around to get to answering your question. <laughs> um, I kid you not. I I'm serious. Sometimes Anne will come home. This is a real conversation that happens almost every day. I always tell people, they say, John, how do I get better at doing podcasting? And my, my answer is always the same thing. When you do a podcast or a show, the very first thing you need to do is sit down and watch it or listen to it three or four times. Because that's the only way you watch yourself and, and get to improve and catch you know, the, the negative traits you have, the positive things, learn how to correct the bad ones, build upon the good ones, blah, blah, blah. blah. So just watch yourself over and over and over again. That's, that's what I tell people. And Anne will come in and I'll have AMC Movie Talk on the TV and I'm watching the show, evaluating how it went. And she'll come in and she'll have this look on her face like this. And I'll be on the TV screen and Anne will be like, what's your line, honey? Where's the part where you stop talking? Yeah, that's, that's the line. <laughs> that's my favorite part. She's like, that's, my favorite part of the show is when you're not talking. When's that part? That's, that's her thing. So anyway, getting back to... Uh, to the question at hand, so for those who remember, he's, he's asking us about Cars and Cars 2. Was Cars 2 a, a, uh, an attempt to redeem the Cars franchise? Or was it just a money grab? Mm -hmm. Look, I'm going to say something that people always get mad at me for saying. Um, but it is the truth. When the question comes up, was that film just a money grab? Or was that film just a money grab? Blah, blah, blah. Here's the truth. Sit down, grab your blanket, because this is some hard truth. Every film in the history of Hollywood is a money grab. <gasps> it's true. Nobody puts up a five, 10, 20, 100, 200 million dollar investment in the hopes of losing all their money, but just to make a nice piece of art. That's not the way Hollywood works. It is the movie business. You want to make great art, 
But at the same time, you have to make money. I mean, it's that's it's the movie business. Studios, investors, producers, they all put up the cash to make these movies because they have a hope that they can recoup their money and hopefully, fingers crossed, make profit. That is the goal of every film that gets a wide release in North America. That's the goal. And if anybody tells you differently, they're lying or they're naive. It's just the way it is. You know, somebody say to me, well, you know, John, Darren Aronofsky, it's, he's, he's just all about the art. No, Aronofsky doesn't live in a bachelor apartment, you know, in, in Brooklyn. He doesn't live in, in a 200 square foot. He makes great money and demands great money when he makes his films. Of course, he wants to make his money while making great art. That's how he wants to make his money. He wants to make his money by making great art. But don't think for a second that a part of the consideration, even for a filmmaker like Darren Aronofsky, isn't, I can be successful and I can live a great lifestyle. I mean, that is part of it. Any studio that makes or finances a movie, it's because they want it to make profit. So in, in, many, in a very, very real way, and this isn't being cynical, this is good. All films ever created in the Hollywood system made for major release are money grabs. No, no doubt, that, that is a part of the motivation in all of them. Um, now that being said, why was Cars 2 made? I, the reason Cars 2 was made, even though the first Cars at the time was the least successful and, the, the, and pretty much recognized by everybody as the weakest of the Pixar films, I think the reason Cars 2 got a sequel is because of one, one guy, and that's John Lasseter. John Lasseter, who is the head honcho of Pixar. He is the head honcho of all Disney animation. He is, he is God over there. Um, and Cars, the first one, was a passion project for John Lasseter. It was a passion project for him because of all his childhood memories of driving Route 6 to 6, that's how he came up with this concept of Cars and blah, blah, blah. And he wanted to go back to it again. And the fact of the matter is, if the first Cars, if Route 66 wasn't John Lasseter's passion project and the first Cars movie was, um, I don't know, Smelly Boot the movie, um, John Lasseter still would have made Smelly Boot the movie too because that was his passion project. And what John Lasseter wants, John Lasseter gets. And he's earned that right. Um, but I think more than any other reason, that is the reason we saw a Cars 2 made um, as opposed to uh, other things that could have gotten made in its place. I don't. I think he might have learned his lessons. I don't think we're going to see Cars 3. Um, at least we can all hope and keep our fingers crossed that he's learned his lesson and we're not going to see Cars 3. So uh, there we go. All right. Uh, Anne, you, you ready to start taking some questions? I got two more mailbag questions here. Yes, okay. I am gathering. She is gathering. All right, so let's move on to question number five today. And question number five today comes to us from Darcy Oliver. And Darcy writes, Hi, AMC. Love the show. My question is directed to John. Do you think there is ever an objective way to review a film, or do you think that film is always subjective? I've uh, been having this argument with a friend, and I think that film is always subjective. Can you explain the difference between an objective way to review a film and a subjective way? Thanks. Keep up the good work. Um, I've talked about this a couple of times, so I'll try to keep this short. Um, all film is subjective. And, you know, I, I say that all the time, but I still get people tweeting me sometimes. They're saying, John, okay, that's fine. You say all film is subjective, but uh, Godfather is objectively a great movie. No, it's not. There is no such thing as an objectively good film. There's no such thing as an objectively good joke. Uh, because for some, I, I explained this the other day, but it always bears, I, I mean, really, this is such an important concept in film and film fandom I should almost dedicate 10 minutes every single show we do just to talk about this because I believe this is the quintessential most important topic in all the film fandom is understanding the subjectivity of film. Um, because here's the thing. In order for something to be objective, it means it has to be quantifiably measurable. Like this uh, glass of water here in this delightful and fashionable AMC cup. Um, for us to tell... What is the weight of this cup with this much water in it? That's not subjective. That's not up to interpretation or up to um, personal bias. It is a quantifiably measurable number. 
So what we do is we would get a scale that's properly calibrated, put the water on that scale and see exactly how much it weighs. That becomes an objective number. That is indisputable. That's not up for interpretation or debate or impressionism. It is that weight. That's what the weight is, objectable. Now, if we want to measure, I've said this before, measure the height of this wall, that is an objective fact because you actually take a measuring tape and measure it and quantifiably say, this ceiling is 10 feet, two and a quarter inches tall. That's what it is. It's not up to your impression. I feel like it's nine feet tall. It doesn't matter what you feel like. It is what it is. It is measurable, provable, quantifiable. Movies are not any of those things. You can measure the length of a movie. This movie was two hours and 12 minutes long, but that tells you nothing about the quality. You can't say there's nothing that objectively, measurably, quantifiably says this movie is better than this movie. Nothing. A comedian tells a joke, one person laughs at it, the other person doesn't. You can't say this objectively was a funny joke. No, you just say to that person it was funny and to that person it wasn't. Now, we talk in verbiage, we, we talk in objective verbiage. I will sit here and say, Man of Steel, greatest comic book movie of 2013. And I believe that. But you, as the people who watch me, know that I say that within the context of understanding that all film is subjective. I can say, you are nuts, my friend, if you believe that, I don't know, 40-year-old um, virgin was, wasn't as good as saving, uh, saving Silverman. All right, I can say that you're nuts, my friend, but, but you understand I'm saying that within the context that I understand that all film is subjective and I don't really think you're insane. Maybe I do think you're insane, but, um, but you understand that. So no, there is no way to objectively review films. All films are up to the interpretation and the impression that a movie makes on an individual critic to an individual audience member. It's all about what did it mean to you? And then we go from there, but there's no way to prove that movie A is better than movie B. We can take anecdotal evidence, right? We can say, oh, you know, on, on Rotten Tomatoes, mm -hmm. this movie had a better rating. We can say at the box office, one movie made more money than the other. We can take all that consideration, but that just adds to the great debate about the subjectivity of film. It doesn't improve anything objectively. So, all right, time for the last mailbag question today. And the last mailbag, and then we're going to get to the live questions that are coming in on the chat board. Ooh, and the last mailbag question is, Dan Tito writes, why did people get mad when The Amazing Spider-Man got rebooted five years after the not-so-good Spider-Man 3, but nobody gets mad when Batman gets rebooted three years after a pretty good Dark Knight Rises? Also, why do people hate The Amazing Spider-Man? If it came out before the original Spider-Man, everybody would love it, but uh, people hate it that it is similar plot points as the original. However... It's a much better movie with deeper characters and better acting. Um, Dan, I happen to share your sentiment. Uh, I've expressed on this show many, many times, I believe The Amazing Spider-Man, the new one with Andrew Garfield, directed by Mark Webb, is in every way, except for score, in every way superior to the first Sam Raimi Spider-Man. I don't believe it's quite as good as Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 2, but I think this first Amazing Spider-Man better in every way better acting better directing obviously better effects better action all that kind of stuff that's that's my opinion of it so i agree with you i i think a lot of people there are a number of people who didn't like it because they wanted that 1950s peter parker again that we got in sam raimi's spider-man films they wanted that um they wanted just to continue because they liked the original films like i did except for spider-man 3 that was garbage but they liked the original sam raimi films and they wanted it to continue and there's nothing wrong with that. It's just that then we allow that to cloud our judgment. We go, just because this new one isn't what the last one was, we're not going to like it. But, you know, there's a lot of people, too, who just watched it and didn't like it. And there's nothing wrong with that. But, uh, you know, but as far as why did they not want it rebooted and why are, is, is everybody okay with rebooting um, The Dark Knight? I, I think we are becoming more and more okay with the idea of rebooting franchises sooner and sooner and sooner. Now remember, there's a big difference between rebooting and remaking. Yes. Big difference. Yes. Because when you're remaking a film, that's like saying taking 40-year-old Virgin, right? And taking the exact same plot, the same characters, and you're just remaking it. You're doing it again. Same plot, same characters, same everything, blah, blah, blah. 
Rebooting is a little bit different because it means, you know, um, this new Batman that we're about to get in the DC Cinematic Universe, yeah, we're rebooting Batman, but it's not the same story as Batman Begins. It's a different story. It's just we're restarting this franchise with new feet, new story, new legs, go. So there's a difference between remakes and reboots. And I think more and more audiences have become more and more okay with the concept of rebooting. You know, I remember when uh, they rebooted The Incredible Hulk so soon after Ang Lee's Hulk. Um, I mean, so the Hulk with um, uh, Ed Norton came out and very shortly after the Ang Lee Hulk and a lot of people's like, whoa, that's too soon. And then the new Spider-Man came out and more people were upset at the fact that they weren't doing Spider-Man 4 instead of rebooting it. But there wasn't as many people upset that they were rebooting it early. Now we're into Batman and no, nobody cares that we're rebooting Batman this early. I think we've become more and more okay with the idea of rebooting uh, these franchises as opposed to remaking them. So uh, that's kind of how I see it. Where, where are we at? That was the last question. So it is time for us to take your questions in the chat board. Anne's got the, uh, the questions open in front of her. You can start putting them in. She's pulling out questions. So Anne, what's interesting in the chat board? I can't read this fast. It's going, it's going pretty quick. Very quick. Yeah. Um, okay. This is actually an interesting topic for me. So I'll ask this question first. Okay. Um, AJ Ragunanen has been campaigning in the chats for a WWE movie. Something like a modern day ready to rumble. Could we see that happening? Um, Garrett, I I haven't been for the longest time. I, I was a huge WWF fan, now now known as WWE. Yeah. Growing up as a kid, I watched Tito Santana, Greg the Hammer Valentine, Junkyard Dog, Rowdy Roddy Piper. Um, you know, I used to watch, I mean, the, the Killer Bees, the British Bulldogs, the, the Heart Foundation. Um, I mean, the that was the era I grew up in and I watched it a lot. And I, I watched a lot of the, what do they call it, the uh, the Attitude Era yes. as well. Uh -huh. When it was Stone Cold Steve Austin and, you know, Undertaker in his younger days and uh, Shawn Michaels and, and The Rock when he had hair. <laughs> um, you the know, X. when his... Shut your mouth, know your role, and shut your mouth yes. era, you know, the attitude era. And, and I stopped watching it sometime after that. Um, Anne grew up watching all that. Yes, that's why I asked this question. Because <laughs> Anne, Anne grew up in a house with my brother in law, her big brother, and, and his buddies, and they just watched wrestling all the time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so she knows this world really good, too. Um, WWE Films has their own filmmaking banner now. Mm -hmm. They've done a number of films, and and some and they've actually made a little bit of money making these films too. Now I, I think they're settling more into direct to home video movies now lately. Yeah. Uh, but I think they still have a branch that is, is dedicated to making um, movies for the big screen. I think it's possible. Look, the fact of the matter is that just because like I don't really watch it much anymore, it's still insanely popular. It still draws huge ratings. And um, I think it's possible WWE may at some point. Now the only reason I think it may not work is if WWE itself thinks it may make them look silly or make their main business of professional wrestling entertainment yeah. look silly. It's um, kind of silly already, though. It, I mean, yeah, it is kind of silly. <laughs> to but, an extent. But that's the only thing that I can see, the only reason I could possibly conceive of that they wouldn't at some point in the future do it. Otherwise, I, I think it makes sense for them to try it. You know, I, what I would rather see actually is not really a modern day ready to rumble, but I would be more interested in seeing um, kind of the darker side of wrestling, like a behind the mask. I don't know what so you like would call it. like a documentary? Yeah, like take what happened with Chris Benoit, for for example. and They never want to do, touch that. I know, but that's the things that I'm interested in is why did things go wrong for these wrestlers after they left their careers? So you're talking careers? documentary as opposed to a narrative. Yes. I have an idea. Boom, WWE, send me the paychecks because I'm going to give you your next big franchise idea. Here it is. <laughs> I remember when I was a little kid, like little, little kid, um, there was this movie about the band Kiss. And I, I don't know if it was in theaters or it was just on TV. I was really little. I can barely remember it. But Kiss, the band, actually had superpowers. <laughs> and they were actually fighting the forces of darkness at night. And I remember there's an animated show when I was a little, little kid about the Harlem Globetrotters. Where secretly after they were done playing basketball... They all had actually spaghetti-like superpowers, and they could do all these things. And they joined up with Scooby-Doo a couple of times. 
man, I'm, I'm dating myself. But yeah, I was like a little kid when all that happened. So here's your idea, WWE. Make a movie that feels real. So you have, um, who's, who's the wrestler we sat with at Iron Man 3? Uh, CM Punk. CM Punk. So have CM Punk and um, Undertaker and Triple H <laughs> and whatever. And like they just finished doing, uh, they put it on a show in New York, Madison Square Gardens. They're all done the wrestling and they're all using their real names. But then Vince McMahon comes into the locker room and says, guys, terrorists have taken over the White House. And all of a sudden, you know, Triple H and CM Punk and Undertaker and uh, 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 I don't know, who's the blonde haired dude that they've been trying to push for a while? I can't, I can't remember any of their names at this point. I can't either. Uh, and John Cena, they all stand in a circle and go, WWE powers activate. And they put their fists wow. together and they okay. all like... Triple H gets this brick, almost thing-like skin, and John Cena grows a 10 feet tall, and CM Punk have, has his arms turned into laser guns, and they're actually superheroes who go out and fight crime at night. There! Billion dollar idea. Boom! Share this everywhere on the internets. This is your billion dollar movie idea for WWE. And they should call it Expendables 4. <laughs> Expendables 4. You know, Anne, I gotta ask you, what's it like being married to a dude this smart? No comment. <laughs> All right, let's move on to the next question then. What's the next? What's up in the chat Okay, board? Eric Urias asks, any news on a new Team America World Police movie? Question mark, question mark, question mark. Thanks. Oh, and it's my 21st birthday. Oh, happy birthday. what was his name again? Eric Urias. Eric Urias. Happy birthday. Happy 21st birthday, Eric. Um, uh, I, I don't think so. I, and I believe, for you know, Team America World Police made by the guys behind South Park. Um, if I remember correctly, that movie nearly killed them. Like it, I remember that they, they look, those dudes look back on the time in their lives when they made that movie as one of the most miserable periods in their life. <laughs> it's a funny movie though. It was, it was a funny movie, <laughs> but they hated making it. It was so much. They thought, you, know, you hear them talking about it. They thought it was going to be so easy. We're going to make this thing. Yeah. With puppets. Oh, cool. and they said it was like one of the most difficult, heart wrenching, exhausting, terrible experiences they've ever had. The results were good. Uh, but they've got a lot of stuff on the go. I I mean, I could be wrong. Maybe there's an announcement floating out there somewhere that they plan on doing it. But as far as I know, there are no plans to do a Team America World Police 2. And I don't think the guys who created it ever want to go back to it. Because I think it was just that hard of an experience for them. And that they're like, okay, we did it. But we're, we're done. We're done with it. So uh, no more. All right. What else we got? Uh, Dana Charter, actually way earlier in the comments, just wrote a comment. And I actually am going to pose a question for it. She said, I want a female James Bond. What do you think about that? Um, you know what? It is killing me right now. But we actually did a story on AMC Movie Talk recently. I'm trying to remember who got the lead role in it. Um, but there, there is basically this a female James Bond um, movie coming. And it, it's killing me now because I, I'm trying to think of this off the top of my head. But we did the story on it. I can even see the picture of the book. But there's a book series or graphic novel series about this woman who's in um, Her Majesty's Secret Service and she's like a special operative agent and she's basically like a female version of a James Bond and they cast the lead character and I remember I didn't like the lead character they ca the lead actor they cast actress they cast I should say it's not Gina Carano no no it's not <laughs> Gina Carano um, and I can't remember it but, but no there should be a female type of James Bond movie but, and I know there is one coming so do me a favor guys in the chat board if you remember the story that we did on AMC Movie Talk had to have been about maybe a month or two months ago. Uh, I'm just having a hard time pulling it up off the top of my head. But um, do me a favor and fire it into the chat board and, um, and, and maybe we'll, we'll figure this out. But there is one coming. There should be one coming. I think they were aiming for 2016. I'm not really sure about that, but let's keep our eyes on that. All right, what else we got? Okay, Daniel has, us, I don't know. Hey, John, what do you think about the current progress of the Fantastic Four reboot? I've been seeing negative rumors, news going around about the movie productions. Love from Malaysia. Well, I'm not hearing great things. Um, this look, don't start running around on the internet with this. This is not a scoop, okay? This is this is not news or anything like that. I I know somebody who's kind of close to the production of Fantastic Four, and. It sounds it sounds bad, um, and I think the people, even a lot of people involved with it, are thinking it's shaping up to be bad. Um, but and some of the things I've heard about the direction they're going, I hate. 
But, you know, it's one of those situations where just because we think it sounds terrible, and if you know, if you ask my opinion, how's it sound, I'm gonna tell you it sounds awful, sounds terrible, blah, 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 blah. We still have to be willing to go into it with an open mind. So I'm gonna say, yeah, right now, this sounds awful. But I'm still gonna be there opening day to check it out and judge it on its own merits. Not judge it for what it sounded like a month ago, judge it for what it is. I am still gonna hold out hope. Josh Trank, who directed Chronicle, I think he is a fabulously talented director. And I trust Fantastic Four being in his hands. Um, and I'm excited about it. I want to see it. But I'm not hearing great things right now. So who knows? Maybe, you know, the first trailers will come out and it'll be look amazing and it'll look awesome and it'll turn us around. But, uh, yeah, what I'm hearing right now doesn't make me excited. Doesn't give doesn't give me a lot of hope. That's too bad. Yeah. Um, to go back to the female James Bond. It's right. Ellen Page. Yes, that was it. Thank you very much. Who, who Which, gave us that? A ton of people, but I'm with you there. I don't see her being strong in that role at all. I Look, I think James Bond, I think Daniel Craig, man, I think badass. Yeah. Someone I would not want to run into in a dark alley. And unfortunately, Ellen, Ellen Page, Page, she has that, like, she has the, uh, what do you call it, already the upfront kind of flaw that she looks she has a baby face, so it's hard to kind of take somebody in that role when they look like they're 16. And maybe that could be a weapon, like having a baby face and being deceptive. But, I mean, she's like your height. Yeah, I, it's she's hard like for me to be a formidable person. And now I think she's, <laughs> I also, yeah, yeah. Um, Ellen's a, a good Canadian girl, so I love me some Miss Page. Awesome. <laughs> Represent O Canada. But, um, yeah, I remember thinking this, but, I mean, once again... Who knows, right? Mm -hmm. the, the filmmakers know what they have in mind, and maybe for what they have in mind, Ellen Page is the perfect casting. Right. I, I, my initial reaction, though, is I don't see her as a badass killer agent, but maybe once we know what the movie is, like the producers know what the movie is, we'll totally change our tune. So thanks for thanks for answering that in the chat. I love having a chat board. It's so, it makes it's it so much fun. easier. Okay, what else do we got? Uh, Ethan Williams asks, what are the chances of the Arrow universe being in the DC Cinematic Universe? I think next to zero. Um, I mean, there was one quote by a producer on the TV show once who said, oh yeah, it's possible that we could do it. And then a bunch of people jumped all over saying, see, they can do it. And no, I... You look, I think it can get just having multiple movies can get real messy when it comes to continuity and all these types of things. And if if you're look, so if you make Arrow, the TV show, a part of the DC cinematic universe, guess what you've just done to Arrow? You've put giant handcuffs on them. Mm -hmm. Now they are completely limited in what they can and cannot do because they have to follow the canon continuity of the DC cinematic universe, which is completely outside of their control. It's, it would I think it would be a terrible, terrible, awful move for them to do. I think uh, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. is pointing, is proving that trying to do a television extension of a, a cinematic universe is a bad idea. Uh, I think Arrow will do much better existing on its own in its own universe so they can follow and make their own rules about which characters do what and who does this and who does that and they don't have to worry about that conflicting with the cinematic universe because it's their own thing. Um, so I don't think, I think the chances are extremely slim and as a fan of Arrow and as a fan of the DC cinematic universe, I don't want those two cross. I think that'd be stupid, like really, really dumb. So, uh, and I think they're smart enough to know not to do that. But who knows? Maybe they're not that smart. Maybe they are that dumb. But we'll have to see. And as much as I love Stephen Amell, I if he went into the film DC cinematic universe, I don't see him playing Green Arrow. I would love him to play somebody else just to ha create that separation even more. Yeah, I mean, I think simply the fact that he is. Green Arrow on TV, I think that precludes him from being a character in the cinematic universe. It, it kind of be like Tom Welling. Like, you can't have Tom Welling in the DC cinematic universe as, I don't know, uh, Booster Gold. You, you can't have him there because people will just look at him and, and think Smallville. I, I mean, so I, I think they're just too closely connected. I, I could be wrong. Could be wrong. I, that's just the way I see it. All right, let's take just a few more. Okay, Nathan Archer asks, do you think there will be an Unbreakable sequel? No. Um, hmm. I, 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 Unbreakable is a really cool movie. Uh, it's the M. Night Shamhammer uh, movie. A lot of people think it's his best. 
Uh, I don't think it's his best, but I, I mean, a lot of people believe it is his best, and it's really solid, and it's really good. And I think there were doors for them to do a sequel to it. Seven years ago, <laughs> I think there were doors uh, available to them to do a sequel. But the fact of the matter is, uh, fairly or unfairly, uh, Shamhammer's name, uh, and, and that's my uh, you know friendly euphemism for M. Night Shyamalan, um, Shamhammer's name is not what it used to be in Hollywood. As a matter of fact, when he just did that Will Smith, um, uh, what was it called, After Earth? Yes. The one Will Smith just did with his kid, they hid his name. And a lot of people still don't even realize M. Night Shamhammer directed that terrible movie, After Earth. And it's to the point now where they realize not only does his name not attract audiences anymore, it actually repels audiences. And audiences laugh now in a movie theater when his name comes up in the credits. So... He directed After Earth, and they totally hid his name. You never saw M. Night Shyamalan's name on any of the trailers for that. They hid it. Um, so I don't think you're going to see a studio be willing to put up the money and take a risk on a film that should have had a sequel like seven years ago. It's too late, and, and, and having Shamhammer's name now is a bit of a danger. Look, and I'm not saying Shamhammer can't make a comeback. He absolutely can make a comeback. He has made enough good films. Look, his last five films have been total crap. But he has made enough good films that we can honestly say it wasn't a fluke. Maybe if you make one good film, that's a fluke. He's made multiple really good films. And I think that means he has the talent in him. Maybe he just needs to get his head out of his own ass and start being a genius again without thinking he's a genius. And he can make some great stuff. And I am personally... As much as I dump on some of his crappy movies, I am personally going to be cheering for him to make a good comeback. I think he's got the talent. I think he can do it. But is the studio going to take a chance in Unbreakable 2? I don't think it's going to happen. Okay. What's next? Von Franklin asks, have you ever walked out of a movie and what was the last one you walked out on? I've walked out of um, three movies in my life. That's, that's how big, Think about that for a second. Think about how many movies I see. I've only ever walked out of three. And all of them except for one, I stayed for, I stayed until at least the beginning of the third act. Uh, the first, I believe the first, I might be getting the chron uh, chronological order here mixed up, but I believe the first one I ever walked out on was the Jennifer Connelly horror film Dark Water. Oh my God, that movie's terrible. So bad. I mean, I just got bored with it. So, um, yeah, about almost two thirds of the way through the film, I was just like, I, I'm, it's like MMA. I'm tapping out. I quit. I can't take it anymore. And I got up and left. I believe the second film that I ever walked out of uh, wasn't because of boredom. was because I was completely offended by it, which was the Johnny Knoxville film Ringer, uh, where mm -hmm. he pretended he was mentally handicapped so he could win something in the Special Olympics. And I understand... In Ringer, what they were they were going for the opposite. They were going to show the empowerment of the Special Olympians. They were trying to show it as an empowering thing, um, but I I think they failed at that. I understand what they were going for, and I applaud what they were going for. But what ended up coming up on screen to me anyway was really offensive. I thought. And I couldn't take it anymore. And and like I, I couldn't be mad at Johnny Knoxville and mad at the filmmakers because I understood what they were trying to do was show the empowerment of Special Olympians and, and that kind of stuff. And so I couldn't be mad at them, but they failed at it. And it ended up making me feel really offended. Um, and I ended up getting up and leaving. Uh, so that was the second one. The last movie that I walked out of was just this year. Um... And I don't know how Soul Video, uh, my friend, for any of you who are fans of YouTube, you know the uh, uh, the Fine Brothers who do Kids React and they do my music and stuff like that. And they're, they're friends of mine and their senior producer, their CFO uh, is, a, is a really good friend of mine, by uh, both of ours actually. Uh, mm -hmm. she's, he's actually, his name's Soul Video John Green and he's actually Anne's surrogate boyfriend. <laughs> when I'm not around to fulfill um, my responsibilities of dating, going out to certain things with Anne because I'm out of town or whatever, uh, Soul Video steps in and takes Anne out on hikes and things like that. So, um, Ladies. <laughs> uh, and so he comes to my office in Burbank and he's like, hey, dude, let's go see movie 43. I'm like, I don't know, man. That looks so bad. Oh, and God. it was opening weekend. But I'm like, all right, let's go in and watch movie 43. And we went into the AMC Burbank 16 opening weekend. There was us and two other people in it. 
and we're watching it, and I watched for about 20 minutes, and then like once again, MMA, tap out. I, like, it was so bad. It was so bad. I just, I, it hurt. It was so bad. I felt so uncomfortable because I was embarrassed for all these people on the screen. It was just terrible. I'm like, I can't, I'm like, dude, I can't take this anymore. And he's like, screw you, buddy. I'm staying and watching this whole thing. I'm like, all right, I'll be in my office. And uh, he watched the whole thing and I, I just couldn't take it. So yeah, three films I've ever walked out on. And not saying that these are the worst movies ever made, but these are the ones I just couldn't take watching anymore. Dark Water, The Ringer, and uh, Movie 43. So those are the ones I've walked out on. Okay, what else we got? I was going to say for me, Jeepers Creepers. I like, yeah, Jeepers I don't get Creepers. you. I love the original Jeepers Creepers. As soon as that monster came and flew and his wings opened up on oh. top of that bus, I was like, what is that? I'm gone. <laughs> crazy. Jeepers Creepers is great. I love Jeepers Creepers. Okay. All right. So, uh, Fabrico Rhino asks, any uh, Walter Mitty Oscar chances? You know, it's funny. Um the Secret Life of Walter Mitty has become a great point of debate uh, amongst me and some other AMC people. I, hard to say, man. This is this is a passion project for Ben Stiller. I had a chance to talk to Ben Stiller back in April, specifically about The Secret Life of Walter Mitty. And I thought it was just another movie he was doing. As it turns out, this, this is a movie that has a long history. It's a remake, but it's, it has a long history with Ben Stiller. This is a film he has wanted to make for a lot of years. This is a passion project for him, and he's just put his whole heart and soul into this thing. But sometimes when you get somebody who gets a movie like that, it can backfire. Because suddenly, their own passion for it can sometimes cloud your judgment about it, right? And sometimes you can't see through your own vision and through your own expectations of what you as a filmmaker are trying to do. And it's hard to step back and just be objective and understand that this, this thing I wanted to put into this movie for the last 10 years, you can't see that maybe it's not working and you just go ahead and do it anyway. Um, so, I mean, so there's positives and negatives to it. There's obviously huge positives being very passionate about a film project. It's hard to say. I, the thing about The Secret Life of Walter Mitty with a lot of the trailers and everything is a lot of audiences have no idea what this film is about. And you watch the, the, the trailers and artistically they're very cool and I'm excited for it. But it's impossible. I have no sense of the direction of the narrative of this movie. I have no sense of it. Basically, I just get these trailers, a lot of random images of, of this guy in this really cool, vivid fantasy world. But I know nothing about the movie, really. So it, it's be premature of me at this point to make any guesses as to what its Oscar chances would be because I don't know anything about the film even after watching the trailers like what's your you've seen the trailers like what what's your impressions of Secret Life of Walter Mitty when you see them um and Ben Stiller is one of my favorite all time favorites she even what's the film Heartbreak Kid she that is like I if you ask me if somebody say hey John Quick what are Anne's two favorite films of all time Easily. Number one is big with Tom Hanks. Yes. She'll cry. She'll literally cry mm -hmm. if she turns turns on TV and big is on it. And that's it. She's done for the night. She'll watch that forever. And I number two might be Heartbreak Kid. I mean, that's the one I hear you it's talk about. Up. It's up there. It's really up there. Anyway. But yeah, the tra like, like you said, the trailer looks amazing, but I just can't tell. I still can't tell what the story is going to be about. I have a feeling it's going to be depressing. And the trailer doesn't really give you that impression yet. Yeah, neither of us have watched the original. Yeah. All right. Okay. Next one. Um, Plague Man Rolls asks, John, Harrison Ford is getting a lot of ads for a nomination for an Oscar for his work in 42. Since the movie came out months ago, does it have a chance? Oh, yeah, absolutely has a chance. Um, I was actually kind of disappointed with 42. I didn't think um, it did justice to the story of Jackie Robinson. Um but that's just me. I know a lot of people who really liked it. I was a little bit let down by it. But what you cannot be let down by is the performance of Harrison Ford in that film. Um, the biggest thing he's going to run up against, man, um, Michael Fassbender in 12 Years a Slave is going to be formidable. Um, that's going to be a tough one for him. So... <sighs> I don't think the fact that it came out months ago is going to have anything to do with it. I honestly really don't think that's going to have a single thing to do with it. It's going to be an uphill battle. I'll be surprised if he doesn't get nominated. Mm -hmm. I think Harrison Ford will get nominated for his performance in that. I think he deserves it. Um, but will he win? I don't think he'll win. But if he doesn't win, I don't think it'll have anything to do with the fact that the movie came out months ago. All right. 
Do we got any more? Yeah, we have a ton. But uh, Tabitha Claxton asks, Hi, John and Anne. I read online a while back ago that there is su- supposedly a Tintin sequel aimed for 2015. Mm-hmm. Um, but she hasn't heard anything since. So is it still happening? Yeah, yeah, it's still happening. This is this is a, once again passion projects. Peter Jackson, Steven Spielberg, they love Tintin, and I believe they're going to do like three of them. Oh. Um, and they're like they're taking turns. It's a great like movie. Steven Spielberg and Peter Jackson. Okay, you produce this one and I'll direct it, and then the next one I'll produce it and you direct it, and that's what they're doing with Tintin. Um, so yes, it's going to happen. If like even if the first Tintin was a bomb and terrible, which by the way it was really good and it wasn't a bomb. Really but good. even if even if it was a bomb and it was terrible, mm-hmm. you got Peter Jackson, and who's more powerful than Peter Jackson in Hollywood? Oh, I don't know, maybe Steven Spielberg. You get <laughs> Peter Jackson and Steven Spielberg saying, um, "We want to do this. They're going to do it, yeah. and it's going to get done." Um, so yes, a Tintin sequel that is on the books and they are going to do it and it is going to come. It might get pushed back a little bit. So they're a little busy too. Yes. It might get pushed back a little bit, but it's definitely going to happen. Absolutely no question. All right. What else we got? Um, I'm sorry about this. Rajan Chaudhari asks, Mr. and Mrs. Campia, as a couple, what is y'all's favorite romantic film? Oh dear. (laughs) Uh, I got mine. (laughs) What's yours? The Notebook. Oh. And believe it or not, I hadn't seen The Notebook until this past year. I'd never seen it before, um, being a big Ryan Gosling fan. Yes. I finally put it on, and I have to say, it's just, it's so good. How do you not end the movie and have tears all through your face? And yeah, the, the right. way they can jump from the them being old to them being young and just connecting that storyline. Yeah, James Garner was beautiful. great in that film. Um for me, and this is really going to contrast the differences between her and me. <laughs> to me, flat out, easily, most romantic movie ever made and will be until the end of time. Amen. Princess Bride. Our love is like yeah, but a that's storybook like a, story. That's not a, that's like a, what do you call it? Rom-com. You have darkness <laughs> in your heart. But it's as real as the feelings I feel. Come on. <laughs> my name is Nigo Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. Ah, come on. True love brought Wesley back from the dead. It was true love that got him through all the trials and tribulations to bring him back to his buttercup. It is the ultimate story of love and romance. And it had Andre the Giant. Andre the Giant wins. Therefore, your argument is invalid. Brian Ar- Gosling wins with Rachel McAdams. They belong together forever. Andre the Giant <laughs> means your argument is invalid. Two right. Canadians in a romantic movie? Come on. How can you not Okay, yeah, that's good. That's good. <laughs> that, that, that is in its favor. Okay, let's take like two more because we're getting close. To, actually, we're over an hour. So let's take two more. Okay, Engine Files asks, John, I was wondering what your thoughts were on Sean Christensen adapting his Academy Award winning short film into a feature length film. Personally, I'm very excited. Curfew was a masterpiece. Haven't seen it. I got to be honest <laughs> with you. I, I can try to fake my way through it, but just be honest with you, I haven't seen it, so I can't comment on that. And the last one. Oh, my gosh. They're scrolling so fast. TikTok. Oh. oh. What? Okay. Thoughts on the Crow reboot? Is there going to be one? Oh, yeah, yeah. There, there is a Crow reboot happening. Um, and it's uh, with your boyfriend. It is. Um, ben Foster? No. Uh, Ryan Gosling? No, he was Justin just in, Timberlake? He was just in Fast 6. Luke Evans. Luke Evans. Um, <laughs> yeah, it, there is a Crow reboot coming, and it is going to star Luke Evans, who was just in Fast 6. He was also in... Um, uh, he played Zeus in Immortals, and he's, he's in a number... He was in that horrible, horrible, horrible Three Musketeers remake, yeah. like, last year or two years ago. But he's a really good actor. Uh, I like Luke Evans a lot. And uh, true story, I'm going to tell this story. So I go to interview Luke Evans uh, at his hotel room in Beverly Hills. And I I ask, hey, can I bring a a cameraman along? Because I I only like to do interviews if I can get them on video. So they said, sure. And nobody was available. So I go to Anne. I said, Anne, can you come along with me and just hold the camera and hit record? Mm -hmm. And she's like, yes. So she gets all dressed up because we're going to the Beverly Hills Four Seasons. And (laughs) we go down. And uh, Luke Evans, I guess you could say he's kind of a handsome guy. Um, you know, if you're into that sort of square jaw, chisel good looks kind of guy, I guess. He's a good looking dude. So so we go into his hotel room and Anne is all dressed up. And I look like the schlub that I normally look like. 
And so naturally, he assumes I'm the cameraman. <laughs> so she comes in carrying the camera. He goes, hey, how you doing? He goes, wait a minute. She's the cameraman? <laughs> I'm like, yeah. And he looks at her. He's like, she's the most attractive cameraman I've ever seen. <laughs> And, and Anne that's is, where my life could have changed, honey. <laughs> and so she's like, God. Anne's like, oh. like, she's like, oh, well, you know, gee, thank you so much. <laughs> so I say to Luke, I say to Luke, I say, well, Mr. Evans, you got amazing taste because Anne is actually my wife. And when I say that, show them the look you gave me, honey. <laughs> that's the look she gave me when I mentioned to Luke that she's that I'm married to her <laughs> and she's like so anyway we do the interview and it was a wonderful interview had a really good time with him he's very charming uh, and we were in there for like 15 or 20 minutes or whatever and so we get up and go and he's like hey thanks that was great and I'm like yeah it was really nice to meet you and Anne is like it was a pleasure meeting you blah 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 and so we walk out of the room and as soon as we walk out of the room and close the door because she's smiling saying goodbye ah she turns to me instantly like, and this is what she says. <laughs> this is what she says. She turns to me and she says, why must you ruin everything for me? <laughs> why? It's like, you, you remember I'm your husband, right? <laughs> why must you ruin everything for me? I could be on the red carpet of <laughs> Fast and the Furious. <laughs> you Instead, could've. I am here. Yes. With all of you AMC people, which is awesome. Too. Yes. So um, <laughs> anyway, folks, that will... Um, that will do it for us. We've gone over time. Thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Listen, let us know what you think about us doing the show live. Uh, we can't always do it live because mailbags are on Saturdays and Sundays, and sometimes we're kind of busy on the weekends, and we can't do it live. But let us know if you like us doing it live when we can do it actually live. So uh, jump into the comment section after the video is done. Leave all your thoughts. Thank you, everybody. Um, for, for those of you who have been joining us in the chat board and, and leaving your thoughts and comments and, and having a good time talking movies with us, uh, I want to thank, of course, my wife, Miss Ann Campia. And where can people find you online if they want to follow you on Twitter? Uh, you can follow me at, by my name, Ann Campia. And uh, you can follow me on Facebook or Twitter or whatever, just at John Campia. Don't forget, guys, send us your email questions. If you've got a topic or a question you'd like us to address on AMC Movie Talk or AMC Mailbag, just send us this address here, amcmovietalk at gmail.com. Don't forget, lots of great films playing in AMC theaters everywhere right now. Head on over to www.amctheaters.com for your theater, showtime, and movie ticket information. And um, that's a little, uh, a little bit of info. Hey, Ann... Where are we going next? We are going to an event for Dallas Buyers Club. We're going to go have lunch with Matthew McConaughey and Jennifer Garner. So <laughs> if any of them asks, I am not your wife. That's right. You are my... <laughs> I am your driver. I am your driver. That, that's what butler. we are. Okay. <laughs> Our butler. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us, guys. My name is John Campia for AMC Movie News. And until next time, bye-bye.